Brought to you by Incogni. Jesus. Pick up any English translation of the New Testament, and that's the name of the miracle-working apocalyptic preacher from Nazareth who walks around the Sea of Galilee talking about the coming kingdom of God. J-E-S-U-S, Jesus. But that wasn't really his name, right? I said English translation of the New Testament. If you were to take a time machine back to the Galilee and walk up and say, hey Jesus, you'd get a confused look. So what was the actual name of Jesus? To help us answer this question, I've enlisted the help of Dr. Benjamin Suchard, a historical linguist with a specialization in biblical Hebrew. So he'll pop in from time to time. Let's start with the source material, the New Testament. See, the books of the New Testament were composed in Koine Greek, which was widely spoken in the Eastern Mediterranean world in the centuries after Alexander the Great. Since the Gospel writers and the Apostle Paul were writing in Greek, they wrote the name of Jesus like this, Jesus, which, as we'll see later, is the name that was eventually transliterated into English. But Jesus wasn't Greek, and his name wasn't a Greek name. He was a Galilean Jewish man living in a predominantly Aramaic-speaking region, a Semitic language closely related to Hebrew. So Jesus is a transliteration of a transliteration of a Hebrew and Aramaic name, specifically a name for Joshua. So how does that work? Well, in the Hebrew Bible, there are two prominent characters named Joshua. First, we have Joshua, son of Nun, the Israelite military commander and right-hand man to Moses, who, according to the Bible's version of history, led the Israelite conquest of the land of Canaan. Then there's a less famous Joshua the high priest, who appears in some of the latest books in the Hebrew Bible as the first high priest after the people of Judah returned home from the Babylonian exile. Even though we use the same English name Joshua to refer to these two guys, in Hebrew Bible manuscripts, there are two versions of this name. The older version for Joshua is Yehoshua, which is most often used for Joshua the son of Nun. But there's another shorter variation of this name generally used for Joshua the high priest, Yeshua. Think of it like the name James becoming the name Jim. It's not really a nickname, but rather a shorter, more colloquial version. Yeshua was the more common form of this name in late biblical Hebrew. For example, Joshua son of Nun is called Yehoshua in the older book of Joshua, but in the much later book of Nehemiah, he's called Yeshua. So the name was interchangeable depending on if you're using the earlier or later form. But it's this shorter, later variation that became popular in Aramaic during the Second Temple period. If you wanted to name your kid Joshua in the centuries after the Babylonian exile, you'd name him Yeshua. So case closed, right? Jesus was living during the Second Temple period when Aramaic became the day-to-day -day language for Jews living in the Galilee. So his Aramaic name must have sounded something like Yeshua. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. And the complication comes from that final syllable, the a uh part of Yeshua. For those of you Hebrew Bible and Aramaic experts in the audience, you know I've been playing a bit fast and loose with that pronunciation. But before we get to that, I want to thank today's sponsor, Incogni. We're spending this whole video sifting through ancient documents to track down the original name of Jesus, all in a noble quest for historical accuracy and curiosity. But there are companies out there that sift through your personal information for more nefarious reasons than historical inquiry. These are called data brokers. Data brokers are companies that collect and sell your personal information to third parties, often without your informed consent. This includes your full name, but also your home address, phone number, and even your employment employment history, medical history, or political affiliation. Many people don't know that you have a right to request these data brokers to remove this data, but this would take literally hundreds of hours of your time to research and contact all of them. That's where Incogni comes in. As soon as you sign up, Incogni sends out data removal requests on your behalf to all applicable data brokers. I've been using Incogni for a few weeks now, and within two weeks, they removed my data from 24 data brokers. If you'd like to protect your privacy today, go to incogni.com slash religion for breakfast and use the code religion for breakfast to take your personal data off the market. The first 100 people to use the code religion for breakfast at the link below will get 20% off Incogni. And with that, back to the show. Yeshua is spelled with four letters in Hebrew and Aramaic, Yod, Shin, Vav, and Ein read from right to left and without vowels. That final letter, ein, is not actually an equivalent to the English vowel, a, but rather it's what's called a guttural letter, one of several in the Hebrew and Aramaic alphabet. Ein is created in the back of your throat. This affected the pronunciation of the name. But we know from, especially from Greek transcriptions, that this little a uh, you hear at the end before the ein sound, the a uh in Yehoshua and the a uh in Yeshua, that wasn't originally there. 
So if you go all the way back in time, the, the names would have been pronounced as something like Ye Yoshur and Yeshur without an A there. Thus, the name probably sounded less like Yeshua, with that prominent final syllable rhyming with words like Kama or Lama or Iguana, but closer to what Dr. Sushard is doing. Yeshua. Constricting the upper portion of the throat to produce what's called a pharyngeal consonant. You might be thinking, that's close enough. Many languages like English do not have an equivalent sound, and that ein sounds close enough for most people to justify the pronunciation Yeshua. And this eventually did become the proper pronunciation of this name. Remember I said that these two names for Joshua appear in the Hebrew Bible, specifically in Hebrew Bible manuscripts. Throughout late antiquity and into the medieval period, hundreds of years after Jesus, Jewish scribes called the Masoretes started adding vowel markers, alerting readers what vowels they should use to correctly pronounce the words in the Hebrew Bible. One of these vowel markers is called a furtive patach also known as the sneaky A. It's a little line added below a guttural letter if that letter appears at the end of a word, because in Biblical Hebrew, guttural letters prefer an A vowel before them. To summarize, that A sound in the final syllable was a later invention to help ease readers into pronouncing the final ein. As the scholar of Hebrew Richard Steiner says, the furtive patach must have originated as a short, barely audible transitional vowel before final consonants, but eventually became so regular and so prominent that it came to be perceived as a separate syllable. Thus, Yeshua is correct if we're following the Masoretic text. But as Dr. Suchard said, this sneaky A did not exist during the time of Jesus. The name Yeshua just ended with a guttural ein. This might seem like a minor quibble, but it's actually very important for reasons that will become apparent in the final section of this video. So allowing for some level of imprecision and regional variation, it's this version Yeshua. that was the dominant form of the name in Judea and the Galilee during the Second Temple period. In fact, according to an extensive study on Jewish names, this was the sixth most common male name for the period. The name appears in the Dead Sea Scrolls, even when referring to Joshua the son of Nun, and it's also found inscribed on bone boxes called ossuaries, which were used around the time of Jesus to contain the skeletal remains of the deceased. And here's where Greek re-enters the scene. In the centuries before Jesus, around the 3rd century BCE, people started translating the Hebrew Bible into Greek, eventually producing a Greek version called the Septuagint. What's interesting is the Greek translators decided to transliterate both Hebrew versions of the name Joshua as Jesus. Go pick up your copy of the Septuagint and you'll notice that the book of Joshua is called the book of Jesus, ironically, the book of Jesus. This means they dropped Yehoshua entirely and transliterated Yeshua, basically following the dominant variation of the name during their own contemporary period. So how did we get from Yeshua to Jesus? To create the first syllable, the Septuagint translators used the Greek vowel iota to create the Y sound. Thus we get ie. But Greek doesn't have a sh sound, so they changed the letter sheen to the closest approximation, the Greek letter sigma. So we get ies. But Greek also doesn't have the ein, so they just dropped it entirely, leaving us with the name yesu. The S was added to the end because that's a Greek grammar thing. It's how Greek renders what's called the nominative case, the grammatical case used for the subject of a sentence, giving us Jesus. This explains why the Gospel writers and Paul use the name Jesus in their own writings. As Greek speakers, they read the Septuagint Bible in their day-to-day -day life, and they constantly quote the Septuagint Bible in their own writings. So they already had an established way to write this name in Greek. And in fact, when Joshua the son of Nun is mentioned in the New Testament, he's also called Jesus. That made its way into Latin almost unchanged as Jesus. But you might notice, where's the J? Well, as Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade taught us, J is not in the Latin alphabet. J is actually the most recent addition to the English alphabet. It started its life as just a fancy way to draw the letter I, a flourish used at the end of a Roman numeral or to start a paragraph. But eventually this fancy I was adopted as a new letter to denote the J sound that entered the English language thanks to influence from Old French. And in fact, early modern English writers would write English J words with an I. Even as late as 1611, when the first edition of the King James Bible was published, I and J were not distinguished from one another. All J names in the Bible, including Judas, Jesus, and John, were all spelled with an I. It was not until 1629, with the first major revision of the King James Bible, that they were finally differentiated. Add some influence from Germanic languages, which makes the S between two vowels sound like a Z, and we finally arrive at Jesus. 
But let's complicate this even more. You might be wondering why did the Greek translators transliterate this name as Jesus and not Jesuas? That guttural ein makes some sort of noise, enough of a noise that later scribes leading up to the Masoretic text started adding the sneaky A to help pronounce it. Which begs the question, when transliterating this name, did they drop the ein because they didn't know how to write it in Greek, or because they were not hearing it pronounced in the first place? Some academics have argued that the name of Jesus sounded more like Yeshu or Yeshu, completely dropping off the final guttural letter because of a linguistic quirk of a Galilean accent. As the argument goes, Galilean Aramaic speakers were supposedly very bad at pronouncing guttural letters. There is some evidence for this position, but it's not conclusive. The main body of evidence that academics cite comes from later Jewish texts. Jesus is mentioned in some rabbinic texts, and there the form of his name is Yeshu without an ayin at the end. So that's interesting because there's also mentions in other rabbinic texts saying that Galileans have a hard time pronouncing the a and the ha and, and things like that. One of these stories that Dr. Sushard is referencing comes from the Babylonian Talmud. The text says, a certain Galilean went around saying to them, who has Amar? Idiot Galilean, do you mean a donkey for riding, wine to drink, wool for clothes, a lamb to kill? Because if you were sloppy with your gutturals and your vowels, donkey, wine, wool, and lamb could all sound like Amar. Another passage implies that Jews from northern towns around the Galilee, like Haifa and Beit Shan, were not even allowed to read the Torah or recite particular prayers, because if they would mess up their eins, they could accidentally say something blasphemous. So are these Talmudic stories evidence that Galileans were dropping the ein and calling Jesus Yeshu? Some scholars say yes, others are not so convinced. In many respects, the Babylonian Talmud is not particularly strong evidence. It's true that the text contains a lot of older material that may shed light on daily life in earlier centuries, but it's a much later text, compiled in the 500 CE. So it might be more possible that these stories reflect the Galilean accent during the 500s, hundreds of years after the time of Jesus. Moreover, we should be skeptical because stories about Galileans being unrefined bumpkins should be taken as unflattering caricatures, and not unbiased reflections of a regional speech pattern. Another tantalizing line of evidence comes from other Semitic languages related to ancient Aramaic, like Syriac and Mandaic, a form of Aramaic used as a liturgical language by the ethno-religious people group called the Mandaeans. In Mandaic, Jesus is called Ishu, and the ancient Christian writer Ephraim the Syrian mentions that that some Syriac-speaking Christians were calling him Isu, both of which lack an ein. Some have proposed that if these variations were passed down orally from an earlier form of Aramaic, they might preserve an ancient pronunciation of the name without an ein. But as is the case with the evidence from the Talmud, this is making a historical argument using data that post-dates the time of Jesus by hundreds of years. Evidence from closer to the time of Jesus is not conclusive. There are some indications that Aramaic-speaking Jews everywhere in the region, not just in the Galilee, were softening their gutturals. For example, the scribes of the Dead Sea Scrolls frequently drop the guttural letters out of Hebrew words when they appear in the middle of the word, but not so much when these letters appear at the end of a word. Ultimately, we don't know whether or not the ein was pronounced, but several recent studies on the subject say that the idea that Galileans were dropping their gutturals is overblown and relies way too much on those funny stories from the Talmud. Whether or not the name had a final ein, though, there's a strong possibility it had short vowels. In, in East Syriac, it's isho with an e and an o. That looks like it comes from yeshu with short vowels. So that's a bit surprising because the name Yeshu has two long vowels in Hebrew. And that's also why in Greek it gets written with a, an eta, a long a, right? Ye, and then sus, a long u. But we do know something about Galilean Aramaic from a few centuries later, when Galilee for a while was the center of, of uh, Judaism after a, a revolt got the Jews kicked out of Judea. There's a study of that kind of Arama Aramaic which has shown that they didn't have vowel length. They just had five vowels, a, a, e, o, u, and no, no length, no a, a, e, o, u anymore, which means that yeshu or yeshu would have been pronounced as yeshu or yesho. And that could have been borrowed into East Syriac. And I think that's a very cool idea that even though Syriac itself originally preserved a length distinction, they heard uh, people talking about this Galilean called 
Yeshua. So they borrowed it with short vowels, and that ends up as Isha. So to summarize, in later Hebrew Bible manuscripts, the name for Joshua and Jesus is Yeshua. During the time of Jesus, in Aramaic, the answer is somewhat more inconclusive, but we can arrive at close approximations depending on how we hypothesize what the Galilean accent sounded like, whether the name had long or short vowels, and whether or not they pronounced the final ein. I think it's likely that if you want to have a really strong Galilean accent and say Jesus, you're going to get Yeshu with two short vowels and no ein. The ein might have been present there because it does show up in Syriac, so yes, sure, with a, a short vowels and an ein at the end there would probably also still be fairly recognizable. Though let's say you were a Galilean who wanted to speak a proper form of the name, then you'd say it with long vowels and a nice guttural ein. Yeshua, 